You're listening to the Ticker Podcast from IR Magazine, a roundup of this week's leading stories and industry comment from the world of investor relations. Hi, everyone. As you are now no doubt aware, European regulators are forcing a fundamental change to the way corporate access operates worldwide. MIFID II is reshaping the price discovery equation, driving a new economics that is quickly disrupting, disintermediating, and democratizing traditional modes of business. On today's program, we'll hear from WeConvene CEO Rat Barnard on how he sees traditional relationships changing and what it all means for the buy side, the sell side, and especially IR teams. Things have changed a lot faster than anyone expected. IRAs are increasingly seeing that they're going to need to do a lot more themselves. That's coming up after this week's Ticker News Update. Despite being one of the most important channels for investor communication, a remarkable number of investor relations websites are pretty stale. IR Magazine surveyed over 600 IR professionals worldwide and found one-fifth said they hadn't revamped their website in at least three years. And 7% of IR departments wait more than five years before giving the IR website a makeover. A growing number of hedge funds are buying into responsible investment. According to an industry group survey of 80 asset managers with a collective $550 billion under management, hedge funds have allocated at least $59 billion to the approach. Firms say they have seen a roughly 50% increase in ESG-oriented demand from either current or prospective investors in the past 12 months. Finally, a prominent conservative idea marketer has weighed in on the issue of proxy advisory firm regulation. A report by the Manhattan Institute says the recommendations of proxy advisors have been influenced by public pension funds and social funds to focus on issues that may not actually be in the best interest of the broader investor community. The report's authors propose two main solutions to the issues it has with proxy advisory firms – greater regulation, and or not requiring investors to vote on every shareholder proposal. The largest proxy advisors, ISS and Glass-Lewis, have faced waves of criticism and calls for regulation during the past year from the likes of NERI, NASDAQ, the NYSE, and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. A proposed law that would require them to register with the SEC as investment advisors passed through the House of Representatives last year. It's still unclear whether it will be discussed in the Senate. as a portfolio manager. Today, he runs WeConvene, a global web-based corporate access platform designed to basically take the hassle out of the whole corporate access rigmarole. We see all three sides of the market, which is, you know, the sell side, and I broadly define that now as not just brokers, but also IR firms, expert networks, independent research providers, and analysts who've gone out on their own. We also service the buy side, and we service corporate IROs. And so we see from all three sides the impact that MIFID II is having. And so, with that in mind, I began our conversation by asking Rad for his thoughts on MIFID's impact on each side of the corporate access triad. Everybody should be surprised about how quickly things have changed. And the changes that I'm referring to are really the democratization of corporate access. And what I mean by that is, you know, historically, it has been largely offered and controlled by the sell side and with a small amount of, uh, of activity being done 
by the buy side directly themselves and, and also then uh, by virtue of that fact with the, with the IROs doing stuff. But it's been democratized because the activity of, of corporate access, you know, meetings between investors, the sell side, and also meetings in, with investors and corporates has just completely started to be done by all three sides and or at least they're talking about doing it from all three sides. And that's democratization because it's no longer, you know, just, the sell side's responsibility to to get this stuff um, organized. So corporates are increasingly hearing about or even talking about doing more of their own activity, taking control of uh, of their corporate access or investor outreach. The buy side, and I'm going to come back to this in a, in a few minutes, the buy side are increasingly talking about doing it uh, themselves as well. And the sell side, you know, more players are entering that space as I pre- previously defined the sell side is all the other players that I, that I mentioned. The traditional guys are going to do less and they're becoming more focused and then the new entrants are picking up some of that slack. And so IR firms, for example, are becoming more active and uh, seeing more demands from their corporate issuer clients to do more on their behalf. So the thing that I think the first real takeaway and, the, and what, what is the surprise is how quickly that is happening because I think a lot of people, when, you, when we asked them last year, thought, oh, it'll take a few years to, to, to impact. But no, in fact, it is happening very, very quickly. And one of the things that's accelerating that, and I told you before that I'd come back to the buy side angle, one of the things that's accelerating that is, is, is essentially the buy side and the position they've taken in respect of corporate access after MIFID II. Basically, the, the lack of clarity from the regulator or all of the regulators consistently across Europe and including the UK around corporate access and you know how people should treat it and all that sort of stuff, the lack of clarity there means that you know, apart from the one thing that says like you can't pay for it, in the UK using commissions, but the lack of clarity amongst them means that the buy side just declared it's too hard to to use court to do corporate access with brokers or using brokers. And so they've communicated the sell side that they're just going to do it themselves. And they've communicated that through action rather than just speech because they're they're building their own corporate access teams. And you know, we, we know about BlackRock, we know about Capital, Wellington, mm. uh, T Rowe Price, Fidelity, all of those global asset managers the, the largest consumers of corporate access are building their own corporate access teams and they're going to do it themselves. And so that's driving that democratization that I talked about, but it's also driving another thing, which is disintermediation. And since we started We Convene, the, the traditional providers of corporate access have always considered you know, platforms such as ours or you know, technology approaches to corporate access as disintermediators, but it's proven now that we are not the disintermediator. In fact, the disintermediator is the buy side because they are the ones telling, you know, cutting out the sell side from the process. So it's happened faster than expected. The rise of the buy side as a as a you know corporate access meeting generator was a surprise to everybody, and it's happening faster than expected because those teams are being built. And the third surprise, which is the you know the net effect of the first two, is that corporates are increasingly now being contacted by the buy side themselves. And they're also increasingly being shown less services from the sell side. Like for a corporate from the US to go to Europe used to be very easy and a broker would do that work for them. But now the brokers are very selective about that and that's really having an impact. And so IROs are increasingly seeing that they're gonna need to do a lot more themselves and, and handle a lot more inbound requests than they previously would have done. I've been told many IROs were perhaps dragging their feet on this. Um, Maybe from what you are telling me, the sell side was a little surprised. And it's kind of the buy side uh, that is really, really driving all these changes. Oh, oh, absolutely. So, yeah, investor relations teams were definitely not fully aware of what the implications here would be. And and a lot of them thought it would be regionally concentrated. But in fact, the the, the impact is global and far-reaching. So the IROs are definitely, you know, they have they have had to come up to speed pretty quickly. But that's not to say that they all are. I think the education process continues, uh, and the impact has been mixed. But it's the impact that it's having is across all market caps. It's across all markets. Just, you know, sort of, I guess, a little bit different in terms of uh, how quickly it's happening. But I still maintain that, generally speaking, it is happening a lot faster than people expected. The sell side definitely underestimated the impact. 
I don't think anyone got it more wrong than the sell side in terms of how quickly things will change and also the impact of uh, what, what the buy side activities would have on their business. It, mm. they, they totally got that wrong. And they got that wrong both in the, in, in the uh, approach to how they price research. You know, they started at a very high number at the beginning of 2017 in terms, in terms of what they were asking the buy side to pay for research. And very quickly, by the end of the year, the quotes were down at 10,000 for global access to research. You know, it started at a very high number, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and it ended at 10 grand. So, you know, the sell side definitely got it wrong. And then the buy side, yes, they, you know, if someone's going to give you something for free or you can use commissions to pay for it, it's an invisible cost. And so they weren't very attuned to what they were paying for corporate access, that service that they were receiving from the, from the brokers. But once the regulator you know, mapped out the rules around MIFID two, the end result is it was just too hard. The rules just put such an onerous framework in place for the for the buy side that they'd be they'd be you know they'd be basically risking getting fined every time they did something. So most of them, and I'm sure you're aware of this, you know, late last year, most of them switched from saying that they're going to use RPAs and CSAs to pay for services. They switched to paying out of their own PL because it largely does away with uh, with with the MIFID two requirements you know, around what they had to monitor for in terms of inducement and stuff like that. So, but once you, once they decided to pay out of their own P&L for services and then also decided to do the, you know, how much they would pay for research and or corporate access, then it became very much a conversation with the CFO of, of a fund as opposed to, you know, a regulatory approach. And it's a budget, right? So the CFO has to help the, the research department of, a, of an asset manager manage a budget. And so they're still accountable for what they spend it on but they very quickly realized through price discovery that the act of organizing a meeting doesn't need to be paid for, or if anything, if there's a logistics charge, it should be minimal. And the sell side, unfortunately, got that wrong as well. So that's why this whole process of democratization of corporate access is happening is because price discovery resulted in basically saying there's a logistics charge possibly, and it might be $50, but it's nowhere near the, the, the cost that was being charged or made on the back of corporate access services previously. So economics, it seems, are driving the changes. Uh, uh, to see how things will pan out, just follow the money. And you point out in your uh, most recent white paper that the it's the sell side, really, that um, needs to pull up its socks. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. There's a Previously, there was limited transparency and no real price discovery was, was ever attempted. And, and now, we, now we have it because people are looking at what the cost of providing corporate access services, what it actually is, because it's, it, it's no longer being cross-subsidized through commissions. And so from a, from a sell-side perspective, um, they have tried to look at the price of you know, what it is, what it costs them to deliver a meeting. And we did the math. And, you know, on average, it's around, you know, $1,000. Every, every time they book a meeting for somebody, it's around $1,000 when you, when you look at, you know, when you add all the costs together of the people that are involved in the process. But it's $1,000 to deliver it, but they're not going to be paid for it. So that's why in that white paper, we talk about the mismatch. Commissions can't be used to pay for it. And commissions are shrinking anyway, because the, the actual absolute commission that you can charge for something has gone down. Right. And... The, the cost of delivering that service hasn't changed because the cost structure of most uh, sell-side firms is still prohibitively high to provide a service that they're not going to get paid for. So there's a mismatch there, and that's why other people are be, you know, getting involved in corporate access because that, that traditional model just doesn't work anymore under, under that price discovery. Now, from a corporate's perspective, you know, they don't get any monetary benefit from being involved uh, you know, in roadshows and, and going to conferences. They, they derive zero monetary benefit. If they do a good job, the benefit of you know, doing corporate access, which is what they should be doing, is you know, it impacts your market capitalization, your valuation, right? So a good IRO is always focused on that and getting that, that, that outcome from a roadshow. But when we looked at the actual cost of doing a roadshow to a corporate, it's important that it's not just about flights. It's not about hotels, but it's also the time of the individuals that are on the road that needs to be factored in, and that's where we arrived at that uh, at that you know the true cost of corporate access because there are three areas. One is the logistics cost, which we all know because they're very obvious. It's the opportunity cost of like having your management out of the office traveling. You know, and me as a CEO of a company, I, I I'm fully aware of what that means. And then the third one is 
just literally the time apportioned cost to having the C-suite on the road. And there is a way to calculate that, which we did. And again, Rad did indeed do the sums. In a white paper called The True Cost of Direct Corporate Access, he crunched the numbers. Bottom line, the total cost of a CEO's time per meeting is $11,555 per meeting. As Rad points out, it's a powerful thing to be able to get access to the CEO for investors. But as Spider-Man said, Whatever life holds in store for me, I will never forget these words. With great power comes great responsibility. This is my gift, my curse. It really underlines um, the IRO's central job in making sure that every, every penny, every dollar of that is spent wisely. Absolutely. I think when people see numbers, you know, they, it usually resonates, right, and drives a point home. Because if, if they literally are just looking at the, uh, you know, the flight and the cars and the hotels and the food, you're missing a big part of the, of the cost. And so, you know, when you, when, and as an IRO, when you think about uh, responsibilities to both your board as well as the C-suite and then ultimately the shareholders, you, you want to know exactly what the cost is of, of hitting the road with the C-suite. And then what that should do is focus the mind of the IRO on spending more time on activities that, that actually create value um, as opposed to, you know, still some of the, the more menial tasks that, uh, that occur. Better or for worse, you know, we convene in terms of how we come into this story. You know, we are here to remove or automate the menial task, which is setting up a meeting. Mm. The meeting itself and who you have a meeting with, that's value. But setting it up, it shouldn't be taking up anyone's time. And, you know, in, in the context of where we started our conversation, the amount of change that's happening and the amount, you know, the increasing uh, need for IROs to do more themselves and also for the, you know, the, to handle the incoming requests from the buy side, it just means that one of the easiest places where you can introduce automation is the actual booking of a meeting. So that's where we come at it from. So we convene uses technology to automate the meeting booking part. But as Rad explains, that automation stimulates a distinction between traditional investor targeting and what he calls investor discovery. The IRO, their real value add in and amongst many other things that they can do is when they are doing a roadshow, preparing for a roadshow, is to think about how to find the investors that need to go and meet so that the C-suites seeing uh, obviously the, the, the people they need to see, i.e. the existing shareholders, but also the new investors the new shareholders, because that's that's ultimately one of the, um, I guess, mandates for an IRO is to keep expanding the shareholder base. And so how do they do that? Well, they can do that by either doing traditional targeting, which is you know what a lot of the service providers out there provide. Investor targeting is, 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 it is used by everybody, and it's different to investor discovery. Investor targeting is you basically say, Take a list of 100 uh, clients. You might download it from whatever vendor you use, but you'd be like, give me all of the long-only uh, investors in mm -hmm. New York and you get 100 names. From that, you then you, know, you, you filter it down based on certain criteria to, to you know, I want uh, only long-onlys, I want only people that do healthcare and they don't own my stock. So you might get from that 100, you might get to about, say, 20, 10, and that's, that's investor targeting. What we do and what I think is a, is a different way to approach it is investor discoveries. So let's take a universe of people who are called portfolio managers and then without even filtering them, just, just send them the uh, event invitation, right? So, and for us, it works through Bloomberg, right? So we, we, it goes both onto the Weekend Ring platform, it goes into Bloomberg. And all it is, it's all mapped and linked by ticker. And so that means that when you, when you distribute your event, 
to, to tell you that you're going to be in New York, it'll show up on the screens of everybody that has your ticker in their interest list or their watch list. And you might not even know that they have your ticker in their watch list or their interest list, but all portfolio managers have these lists because that's how they maintain their focus. But we give you direct and real-time access to anyone who has your ticker in their watch list. And that, that way you're discovering new investors as opposed to targeting existing people that fit a certain profile. It's a very different way of doing it. Mifid sounds like it's really good for IROs. It it used to be the um, a roadshow would essentially be a negotiation with a broker. You'd see some of the big traders they wanted you to see, and uh, some of the investors that you wanted to see. Um, now that dynamic is no longer part of the equation. The power the power is definitely going to be in the hands of um, of the IRO. They're taking back control, and so. They will see people who are outside of the client list of a of a sell side, and that's that's taking back control. Right. So, can the sell side use this? Can they value add using this technology, or are they just not part of the equation anymore? Well, they 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 can, and you know, to me, and I've always argued this, you know, the sell side is part of this ecosystem because they are and they do represent the the capital markets function, right? And mm -hmm. um, you know, when people when people talk about uh, you know, doing a, a secondary placement or a primary deal or you know, some other type of uh, proxy voting exercise, or what, there's a whole bunch of different services that the seller side do provide that is, is valued, and therefore they should be part of the ecosystem. But just the way that they do it and how they and you know, who they do it for, that's going to change and, and should change, and they can use technology to help them do that. So you know, that cost that I mentioned before of, a, of about $1,000 per meeting in mm -hmm. terms of meeting booked, that can be that can be crushed using technology because you just don't need people sitting there doing like booking meetings. It's the least valuable part of the entire interaction is the booking of the meeting, and you know it's it's akin to basically like saying the most valuable part of a holiday is the booking process. It's not like the most valuable part of the holiday is actually going on holiday. Right, booking it is is the worst part of it, and so you know the sell side needs to remove. Or I think that it's already happening. They are removing the emphasis on the booking bit and focusing more on the value that they create around the whole process. So, you know, doing better targeting, doing much more origination, going and talking to more corporates. You know, that that's that's value creating, not the booking bit. So yes, they should choose. To, they should use technology. They can um, become much more focused and much more efficient in terms of how they provide this service. And then they can remain part of that ecosystem because the cost of doing it is not going to be so high. Back on the corporate side, this would be great for emerging markets companies. If everybody is collected on the same platform, then an obscure company from Argentina could sit aside uh, peers in the same city as the investor. Um, but all they need to do is establish corporate access with them. Absolutely correct. Yes. Technology can help you know, all three sides, but especially for corporates, you know, in emerging markets or in out of favor sectors, you know, being able to discover investors or get in front of them uh, using technology, is, it's just going to help them a, a lot more. And, and they're in charge of it. Like they really do control their own destiny. Right. So they're managing that process. They're not relying on somebody else to do it. And with it, you know, they'll, they'll have a lot more visibility. And I think they can, they can achieve great results in terms of optimizing the time of their C-suite, which hopefully translates into, into a better uh, market cap valuation, recognition, all of that sort of stuff. So yeah, right. all helpful. Okay. Uh, what does an IRO then need to do to convince their boss that they need a bigger budget um, to do all this stuff that the sell side used to do? Is, uh, is management on board that things have changed and the IRO needs a bigger budget? Um, your thoughts on how to tell their boss and how they need more money well i think that uh there is there are already enough examples of how the world is changing year to date that you could you know put together a pretty quick presentation two pages for the c-suite and the board to understand that ir has just become a much more important function with a slightly broader uh responsibility set because of the way that the the world is changing now the one thing that i would say though is that Increasing the budget, yes, so that you can buy technology, 
but the benefit of, of some of the new technology that you'd be looking to buy is that it's not expensive mm. and it doesn't have to be expensive. You know, our, our product costs 1500 US dollars per annum for one IRO. And by spending $1,500, you immediately don't have to hire an additional person to just manage roadshow logistics because that's what our technology does. So you spend 1500 and you've got a solution for automated corporate access management. You don't have to hire a person to do that. I, you know, I would, I would definitely say that the theme is not I need massively bigger budget or I need to grow the team. The, the theme is I need, I need some in, increase in my budget but I definitely need to use technology better to, to just manage my to manage my workflow more efficiently. So I'm not literally booking meetings. I'm actually doing other valuable things. Buying technology to help you become more efficient at some of these newer or increased in, in increase in responsibility that you have, especially as far as it relates to like managing investor outreach and corporate access, you know, buying technology doesn't have to be expensive. Like that's not the driver of the budget going up. The driver of the budget going up will be that you probably have to do more travel as an IRO yourself, um, you know, to, to, to scout out the investors for proper meetings later on with your CEO when, when they get on the road. That's where the budget's going to change. Great. So to wrap up, where will we be in one year? I would identify three, three or four things. Number one, I think the sell side in the traditional sense, we'll be doing a lot less corporate access. They will not be irrelevant to the process. As I mentioned before, they're a key part of the capital markets, but they will be doing a lot less because the economics just don't support it. The second thing that, I'll, that I think we'll see, you know, where we'll be in a year from now will be, there will be true price discovery for, for meetings with corporates and for meetings with analysts or experts, and it'll be visible to, to people who want to consume that. Pricing will come in. And then the third part is that um, I do think that a lot less companies are going to be covered you know, by research analysts. And so a lot less, lot, lot more companies will be off the radar screen unless they become proactive. So they will, they, will have, they will be more proactive. So in other words, I'm saying coverage will shrink and therefore companies will become much more active in terms of doing stuff themselves. And the fourth point is paid for research is going to, I think, become much more commonplace. You think paid research will get credibility? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it'll, it'll gain credibility because it has to. Because, you know, again, if, I, if, I'm a, if I'm a corporate medium cap in a sector that could be interesting or is interesting, but no one knows about me in that space, how do I, how do I even begin the journey of, like, getting on people's radar screens? Well, there are two approaches. One is that, I will do much more investor engagement on, you know, through corporate access myself. And then number two is that I will pay somebody to write a research report on me. And historically paid for research has kind of had a bad uh, rep, mm. but it's not a, uh, um, a fluff piece, right? It's, it, it literally is a genuine analyst writing about a company providing forecasts, but they just don't provide a recommendation or a target price. They can provide an opinion, but that's, that's about it. And I think that's going to become much more mainstream because we've seen it already, you know, in Australia, 16 analysts year to date have already left, 16 top ranked analysts have already left the sell side. And that's in Australia, huh. right? You know, Macquarie culled its European research team, right? They're, they're now covering six sectors only. And, JP Morgan lost their US healthcare analyst. He's been, he'd been there for like 10 years or something like that. He was number one ranked. And so these departures, they're signals, right? And it's happening a lot faster. And so the, the, the coverage universe will shrink. It will. And therefore, the paid research opportunity or independent research opportunity is, is, is it very much going to come into focus. Exciting times. Oh, absolutely. It's taken us a long time to get here, but the, you know, there, is a, there is a lot of change and it's, and it's all for the positive. Rod Barnard, thanks for joining us on The Ticker. It is my pleasure. Thank you very much, Jeff. And that's your Ticker podcast for this week. Rod and his team have written up a slew of white papers on the changing cost dynamics of corporate access and what it all means for IR teams. And you can find them all at weconvene.com or at irmagazine.com. 
before we go, I'd like to remind you about a couple of upcoming events. First off, our very first IR Magazine Forum and Awards India gets underway Friday, June 15th. Spanning multiple industries, this one-day event will focus on key issues affecting the evolution of shareholder communication. The forum will be followed by networking drinks and a short award ceremony to recognize those leading the way in IR excellence. Then on Thursday, June 28th, London will host the annual IR Magazine Awards Europe. It will once again follow on the Euro Think Tank, an event exclusively for senior corporate IROs and other senior level executives with IR responsibility. Check out irmagazine.com for details. Thanks for listening. In Montreal, I'm Jeff Cassette. You've been listening to the Ticker Podcast from IR Magazine. For free access to all the latest global investor relations news and analysis, register at irmagazine.com or download the app.